That's my promise to you. Yes, sir. Ambassador, <clears throat> thank you for being here and your message this morning. I think it, it really encapsulates what a lot of us believe. Our biggest concern is how do we get through the elephant not in the room? Because, you know, his electability versus your electability, there's no question you would, you would prevail. Um, but we, have a, we need a strategy or tactics to get through that uh, MAGA world. So how do I win, right? That's the question. Well, first of all, it sure would help if y'all all agreed to caucus for me. Can we just say that? That's the first thing. Look, I think that um, I have focused very much for months coming to Iowa, going to New Hampshire, going to South Carolina over and over and over again and get used to this face. I'm not going anywhere. <clears throat> Our goal was, I'm trying to, one, earn your trust, earn your vote. The way this will happen is this is not 2016 all over again. If you notice, if you don't make the debate stage, you're pretty much out. We started with 12 candidates. The first debate was eight candidates. The second debate was seven candidates. The last debate was five candidates. This debate next month, it'll be December 6th in Alabama. I expect there to be three candidates on the stage. So going into Iowa, we're going to see three to four people fight for Iowa. A couple people are going to drop, and then we're going to go into New Hampshire, and then we're going to fight for Granite Staters. Then more people are going to drop, and then I go head to head with Trump in my home state of South Carolina, and we take it. Yes. <laughs> but what's important is we want to do well in Iowa. We want to do well in New Hampshire. I mean, South Carolinians are tough. You got to earn it, right? They don't just give it to you, you got to earn it. And so we want to do that. It can be done. But what I have heard is it's not that people don't support Trump. They do. But when they think of the chaos that follows him and the fears that we have, the number one concern that I hear from Republicans everywhere, from independents too and from Democrats too, is everyone knows America will not survive a President Kamala Harris. We won't. And so this is about how do you get someone who can win the primary that can win the general. And you know, if you look at the polls, I think it shows the other candidates, Trump included, win by two, three points over Biden. If you look in those same polls, I beat Biden by 10 to 13 points. So this isn't just about the presidency. This is about us winning governorships all up and down the ballot, Senate races all up and down the ballot, and House races up and down the ballot. We want to get all of that so we can start getting our country back on track. I trust Iowans. I really do. I trust them to get this right. I think they know that the world is in trouble. I think they see the threats against America. I think they're tired of having government, of, of them working for government, not having government work for them. And what I would ask is, I need you to all go tell everybody. Go spread the word. This is great, and we love that we're doing this. We had a huge crowd yesterday. We're going to have more today. But it's only as good as if you go tell people that you're going to support, and it's only as good as if you fill out this caucus card and say we're going to be with you. I've never caucused before. Y'all have. <laughs> you know how to do this. Yes, sir. Thanks again for being here in, uh, in Iowa. And uh, you talked a lot about pocketbook issues and how we're having a pinch because of inflation. There's a class of citizens out there called family caregivers. And they're spending over $7,200 a month. If you were like me, a veteran military God family gosh. caregiver, we spend over 11500 out of our pocket. What are some ideas that you have to alleviate some more of that pinch at the pocketbook when it comes to family caregiving? You know, that's an issue that hits home to me because Michael and I take care of my parents. They live with us. They're 87 and 89. By the way, um, there's not a time that I sit home 
for dinner with my mom where she doesn't say, are those people still crossing the border? It's, it makes her crazy. Um, <clears throat> but I know the sacrifices because it's not just the money. It's the emotional toll. It's the time of taking them back and forth to the doctor. It's the time of being with them. My dad say a prayer is going to the hospital today and it's making sure that you're there for them and you're talking to the doctors and it's a huge toll. And we are seeing a generation that needs more care and we're seeing a younger generation that's having to really sacrifice to do that. We've got to find ways. The reason why I said I wanted to cut taxes on the middle class is to do whatever we can. But the biggest thing is the health care system in this country, how can we be the best country in the world and have the most expensive health care in the world? Truly, at the end of the day, that's, that's the focus. And the way we're going to deal with that is we're going to just open it all up. We're going to make them have to show us everything. I want insurance companies to the hospitals, to the doctors, to the pharmaceutical companies, to the PBMs. We're going to make them show us everything. And once we see their warts, and once we see exactly what they're doing, that's when we're going to start to fix it. If we just dealt with the insurance companies alone, we would cut our health care costs in half. But I'll tell you, last time my mom was in the hospital, she went and a nurse came up to her to give her some Tylenol. And she said, I don't need it. And the nurse said, honey, go ahead and take it. You're paying for it anyway. And when we got her out of the hospital, we get this bill that was negotiated by the insurance company and the hospital, and no one asked us anything. The patient has sat in the back seat for long enough. We have to get it to where the patient is involved. When you go get your car fixed, what do they do? They say, well, we can do a temporary fix and it's gonna cost you this much. Or we can do the full-fledged fix and it's gonna cost you this much. But you decide, because you're in the driver's seat. We are gonna fix healthcare in a way that the patient is now in control. The patient decides what care they get. And not only that, doctors give you those, t don't give you those 10 tests because you need them. They give them to you for the 90% chance they'll get sued. We passed tort reform in South Carolina, we've gotta pass tort reform in America. That's gonna be a huge thing that we do to really get our costs down. And then the final thing is, in South Carolina, I eliminated certificate of need. And if you don't know what certificate of need is, it is this, I don't know, I think it's a power structure, but basically it says that if you have a hospital here, you can't put another hospital for X number of miles. If you have a nursing home here, you can't put a nursing home for X number of miles. If you have a surgical center, you can't put a surgical center for X number of miles. Well, what does that do? It alleviates competition. I grew up in a family business. My mom would always say the best thing that could happen to us is if our competition went across the street because we'd stay good on our service and the prices would go down. That's what you do for health care. We need competition because then all of a sudden, guess what? They're fighting for you. They're giving you unbelievable service. They're reducing all the prices to get you in their door. We've got to go and create demand and a want that those health care systems go to the patient and fight for the patient. When we do that, the patient will be back in the driver's seat. And I think that's going to go a long way to giving cash in the pockets of caregivers and making sure that they're given some relief along the way.